I'll first ask you both, um, you know, what was that first instinct to get involved in manufacturing? Um, so we talked about Toyota, John, I mean, were you always a, a big car guy or what was the initial inspiration to actually get hands on and, and be, be involved in manufacturing? I think the first time it's kind of a joke about a uh, like seven years old supercharging my bleep, my big wheel uh, was probably the beginning. <laughs> but uh, the first time I had to rebuild a, a car suspension, I did that in high school and uh, just taking everything apart and realizing, you know, the one I'm very curious about exactly why everything was set the way it was. And then I bought a book on chassis engineering and read that and said, okay, I'm going to be a mechanic. And then my dad said, uh, step that up a little bit. And I said, a mechanical engineer. And he said, yeah, that'll do. So, but I've always been hands-on just wanting to learn new things. Gotcha. Joseph, same question. Was that your experience as well? Not at all. No. Um, I was cursed as a freshman by a senior that said, keep an eye on all your classes. And I ended up uh, getting into the manufacturing world. And uh, truthfully, I thought I'd always go back into academia or learn more, become a an expert in some sort of theoretical or uh, semi-applied, but in manufacturing, you get to see the actual tangible results in a way that the I could not get in education. So uh, the practical education standpoint of it, manufacturing really has um, has kept me in it just because of the interest of figuring out how it actually works in, in that world. So I, I've right. grown to appreciate it over time. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good segue to a question we have here in the chat. What is the specific relationship that you both see between mechanical engineering specifically with manufacturing? Um, so, of course, they go hand in hand. But what what is it that, you know, maybe drew you to the field of manufacturing through your, your initial mechanical engineering studies? Uh, Joseph, you want to field that one first? Sure. I have an affinity for materials, materials knowledge through a mechanical. How does it break apart? How does it form together? How does it act in certain situations? And in the manufacturing world, you get to see a very real uh, reaction, whether it's an optimization of a process, uh, whether it's a, um, a new development that needs to be done uh, millions of times that someone can practically tell you can be done dozens of times and you just need to scale it up. Uh, manufacturing is a way to... It's, it's a more applied mechanical world in my eyes, and I've seen that to my advantage to be successful. Awesome. That's, that's great. John, same question. Um, I, I really I'm, I'm, I agree with Joseph on the materials aspect. I really love the study of materials and then seeing the failures. Uh, something that will happen, a machine part will fail. Trying to figure out exactly why it failed, you know, you've got a lot of tools at, at, at hand, scanning electron microscopes or whatnot, you know, and... Uh, dissect it down, figure out what kind of, you know, studying the heat treatment process of it, the cleanliness of the steel, the type of material, the coating, mm -hmm. and then how fast can you turn it around and make another one? And then at the, at the same time, you know, so you're all these backup plans, but at the same time, understanding heat transfer and uh, solid mechanics. And, uh, and so you're, you're just applying all these different aspects that you learned in school uh, to, to figure out exactly why, you know, it's a bork, uh, a bolt not torqued to just enough so that you understand how that, that cascaded through the entire process. And so you can make that system last longer and better and produce a higher quality for its entire life or detect when it's going to, when it's going to go out of spec or when it's going to break before it actually happens. So you can schedule it. So I think that uh, both of your descriptions there gave us a good idea of, you know, what got you in and based on your interests into manufacturing. Can you both talk a little bit about what it is you actually do on a day to day? So that gives our attendees uh, a better sense of uh, what they can look forward to or, or what they should avoid or, you know, any advice there. But um, why don't we start with uh, John, uh, if you can talk a little bit about what, what you do in particular. Uh, day to day, I mean, just walking through the very first thing, uh, sitting down with the entire team, the maintenance team, your, all your other uh, engineers, uh, the production side, and, uh, and, and then going over all the previous day's problems and understanding what, you know, something ran out of spec, why did it run out of spec, and then figuring out how to divert those, uh, those resources towards uh, things that you can work on and then scheduling a priority wise. Um, and then 
after that meeting, if I've got nothing immediate, I go out to the floor and make sure that everybody knows that I'm there for them if they need to. Any machine operator, if they've got any kind of quality concern, I want to know about it, and then I'll and they'll, they'll that you know that rapport, establishing that rapport with all your team members is uh, is very critical to to making sure that if they feel uncomfortable about anything, that they need to stop and let me know so we can get on it right away. Yeah, Joseph, you have an, a similar experience there. And um, if, if so, you know, what have you seen shift over your time? Uh, are there tips that you can impart to our viewers about how you would do it better if you if you started um, right now? Well, I'm going to agree with John on a lot. You start the day off with your team or with a various department that you're working with. You're working with the operators to understand what was the previous shift, what kind of uh, things went well, what didn't, what kind of corrective actions you're going to be involved with, what kind of meetings you're going to expect for the next six hours, and um, you work with your own personal team of various engineers, or if you're in a smaller company, um, your boss, and you decide what your priorities are at that time, and throughout the shift, throughout the day, you're going to have those change as things go down, as things go up, as things tend to happen. Uh, for somebody that's going into it, uh, either raw or from a different industry altogether, it is important to understand the process, walk the process, um, be with the operator, learn how they operate day to day. Is it really as optimized as it looks on the sheet of paper that says this is the operating procedure? And if so, great, then it's an easy you're optimizing it. You're going to go through and practically look at it when it's a little more difficult you have to work with the operator, work with maintenance, work with other engineers to figure out where are their gaps and how do you correct those gaps. And for someone that's coming out of college, you have that knowledge fresh in your head from your books and from your teachers and your classes. And you could provide good insight as that new voice. As someone a little more seasoned, you have what has worked in the past experience-wise and really establishing that rapport with the operator, with the engineers, allows your voice to come uh, strong. That's great. I think that gives uh, really specific insight to what you're actually doing, because um, oftentimes a title does not translate into the day to day. So thank you both for that. Um, we have a couple questions here about the role of emerging technology. So one specifically called out that I'd like to start with is about uh, 3D printing or, or additive manufacturing. Um, for both of your fields, can you talk a little bit about how that might make a big difference or not? But certainly this is going to be a uh, transformative technology for our society. So why don't we start with John on that in the automotive space? Oh, yeah, 3D printing is great. I mean, you're talking about plastic. Um, and so instead of having machine shops having to, to make stuff and waiting two, three weeks for it, we've got several 3D printers ready to go, just upload it and, and have this stuff ready right away. Uh, robot grippers or anything that we need to prototype for a new project, we'll print up a, a new part design and then go through and understand, can, can it even fit over here? How's it going to work through the entire process? So, but then you also have the, uh, the steel portion uh, so you can look at things that you couldn't even incredibly difficult to machine and whatnot. Uh, but also you've got powdered metals kind of a situation where you can do uh, high temperature sintering, you know, so that's going to be uh, some, a lot of great stuff coming out that we're, we're looking to apply. Excellent. And Joseph, what about at Honeywell? I'm going to say that there are parts of Honeywell that 3D printing has become a, a must. If you don't understand it, they don't want you really taking the time to learn it because we need you to know it right off the bat. So having that knowledge, whether it's at IM3D competition in ASME or something that you do on your off time or something you learn in a course, that's going to be at a premium. There are other parts of Honeywell, like where I'm at right now, which is a little more legacy equipment, a little bit more the process is the process and everything that you're doing is either to improve or otherwise. And some of that introducing uh, the idea of additive manufacturing is slow going and it is a hurdle that you have to jump over. So depending on where your interests are and depending on what your passion is, uh, some of them, it is, we want you, we need you, come on in, we're going to show you, and off you go running. Some of it, it is, why do you even want to talk about that? That's what other companies do. We need you to focus on this. So it's a little bit of both, and um, sometimes you just have to wait for the industry to kind of compel some of the more legacy projects, legacy equipment mm -hmm. to get technology involved. 
So with that, we have a, a cool question in the chat uh, from a key volunteer, ASME volunteer, about if there is a new technology that should be introduced with your own company, how could you make that business case? If you see that this could really help the way the business is run, um, is there a specific set of recommendations you would make for the process to put that forward, make a pitch, and um, you know put your best foot foot forward so that your company can innovate and instead of responding with all of those legacy technologies you were just mentioning. Uh, John, uh, in your automotive experience, is, is there a process for that? Uh, we, there's just a lot of communication uh, that we, uh, so we, you know, planning out a new project is, is way, way, way in advance when you're talking about having to make, you know, 20,000, 30,000 pieces a month, you know, the, the equipment and the manufacturing and, and looking into all that. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of communication early on. So, and I, and, and they want to bring us in all the engineers to make sure that we understand what it is that we were looking to make and do we see any problems with it and any recommendations. And that's, that's just lots of communication between us and the management and other teams. So no real exact process, just go ahead and tell us what you think. And, and we will, we want to look into it. Yeah, definitely. Joseph thoughts on that. Know your voice. If you have a uh, supervisor, if you have a department that you work with a lot and the, the business case is there, and plus you know the person that will get that done, talk to them, convince them it's their idea, work with them, and it'll happen. If you do not know how to use your voice effectively, you're going to either fight a brick wall, you're going to present a business case that doesn't match the company's business case at that time, so also a timing of knowing when funds are available, when opportunities arise, whether that's at the end of a quarter, at the end of a fiscal year, or if there is a, um, an end of the year review when they ask you, are there anything that's holding you back from your true potential? What are your passions are? And you bring up this and you say, this is why it's so important. This technology, I can see it in this department reducing uh, downtime 20% and you show them actual numbers or some rough estimates right there you've got your voice you've got your time and you've got your project for the year that you want to work on you're golden if you it, it's something you have to learn unfortunately it's it's an experience thing that you have to work with your supervisor and your company but the possibilities are glorious that's that's really fantastic to hear and i'm hopeful that asme can be a part of that journey for a lot of people and, and with that we have a question here in the chat about specific manufacturing courses that um you know maybe newly graduated engineers can take um asme has a learning and development platform but of course we, we're hearing from industry all the time that once graduating um you know uh, the, the young engineers often need some more training uh, and often that's industry led. So can you talk about some of your key experiences that when after you graduated school, um, you found were really important for your manufacturing trajectory? Uh, start with John on that one. Oh, um, uh, there was just a lot when I first started uh, that I did not know about manufacturing. Um, uh, the G code side of it, uh, the way uh, CNC controls. So, the manuals are, are pretty huge, but the thing to, to know is, is that you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of parameters within these machines that you, I, I would sit down and just read through all of them and make notes and say, I can take advantage of this one, this one. And that's why right now I'm a, kind of the G code expert at my, at my company. Uh, they, they come to me if they, you know, if they want to do something crazy and uh, I can tell them, you know, there's a, there's a way to do that. And, you know, I'll go through all my notebooks and whatnot, but basically a lot of G code programming and, and, and surprisingly a lot of Excel VBA. I do a lot of uh, data crunching and be able to, um, I mean, uh, at my last company, uh, I had to process terabytes over the weekend and that was between different programs. So writing uh, auto it scripts so that the programs would talk to each other and then open up templates in Excel so that it would, yeah, so after it was on all processing, I can come back through all the data again and understand the, the specific changes that I need to make in the process uh, that how would it have affected the last three months of production or something like that, you know, so. Excellent. Yeah. Joseph, uh, same question. Uh, we're wrapping up on this session. So if you've had, uh, you know, some advice specifically in this space you'd like to impart for our viewers, uh, that'd be really helpful. Much appreciated. Uh, for uh, Going back to the question, though. Uh, for smaller companies, they will bend to what you know. 
So if you are good at AutoCAD and they don't really have a CAD software, they will get you AutoCAD so you can be successful. For larger companies, they're going to say, that's great, you know AutoCAD, we're gonna send you to SolidWorks and you're gonna be working in SolidWorks or you're gonna be a Creo guy and they're gonna have you spend a week learning their system. So as long as you know how to learn quickly, as long as you know how to adapt and to work with other people, uh, very much learn manufacturing history, learn why your company is where it is and the operators, and, and that'll help um, build forward.